Hello, Bravs. We're back with more books. Um, these are newly purchased books. Well, there's four of them that I got the other day, but I forgot to put them on my last one. But let's go ahead anyway. And I had to work for these. Not only did I pick them out at a thrift store, but I had to wait in line a good 20 minutes. So I literally worked for these. Never Let Me Go by Kaz Kazuo, Kazuo Ishiguro. I don't know how to say it. I would have preferred a hardcover of this book since I have no intention of reading it. And it's not worth all that much. Oh, and it's got underlining in it. Son of a bitch. Well, I mean, that's what happens when you don't scope through the books. This apparently won a Nobel Prize, and there's one booktuber that I follow who uh, gets rid of books if they aren't highly rated. I, I'm assuming that since this won the Nobel Prize, it's probably highly rated by uh, readers as well, but I don't know. A page turner and a heartbreaker. A tour de force of knotted tension and buried anguish from Booker Prize winning author Kazuo Ishiguro comes a devastating novel of innocence, knowledge, and loss speaking of loss about the lost American chillers keep buying these mainly because they are all seem to be autographed I don't know who the person was that Purchased these, but apparently this guy autographs every book he puts on. One is a Michigan chiller, and one is an American chiller. I did not check to see if I already had these. I've started collecting them just to, since I see them all around all the time. I get them for 50 cents, so at some point I'll have a whole collection of signed ones, and then I can sell them. Other than that, I have no real interest in them. Uh, ditto with Stephen King. I have zero interest in him, but he has resale value, and I will sell some books on occasion just to pay for what I purchase. And thus, my entire library, several thousand books now, probably approaching 5,000. If I can guesstimate right, since I have about 2,500 on, uh, what's it, Libib? Libib or Libib. And I would say over half of my books are non-ISBN, so basically I have probably 5,000. We also have an amazing pumpkin beer that's 12%, so if I start stumbling and mumbling and slurring my words you know why the wastelands the dark tower book three as i said i have no interest in king he's a bore to me always was a bore to me hey she hugged him a final time then passed on with her hand resting on c's sunburned shoulder fare ye well and Tabitha came last. When she began to kneel, Roland caught her by the shoulders. No, say, you shall not do. And before Eddie's amazed eyes, Roland knelt be it's, it's embarrassing. It's embarrassing writing. I mean, it's... It's embarrassing. It's fucking doggerel. Dross. Insomnia by Stephen King. Doubt this book is even worth the shipping cost it would cost you, but I could be wrong. I mean, it might be a first edition and it might have some value, but I only bought it. So at some point I'll have an entire collection of his as well as the American Chillers and I will sell them. Or if I ever get a bookstore like I'd like to. I can have this book here. I can sell it for like five bucks and make ten times what I paid for it. I know I'm a big time, big time 
entrepreneur here. Ralph E. Sternison, Edvard Munch, close up of a genius. I was reading something about uh, Munch where he <laughs> he basically would never let. Yeah, there it is. Munch was quick, quick to flare up and slow to forget an insult, finding it easy to believe that people wished him harm. He imagined he had enemies and secret opponents who were out to get him. A well-known Norwegian painter for whom he had no liking once sent him a poverty-stricken colleague, arriving around nine in the evening just as Munch had gone to bed. The visitor asked for a handout of ten kroner. Years thereafter, Munch would say, I suffer from insomnia and prefer to go to bed early. Even so, I stay up until late in the night waiting for the beggars my enemies send me. This guy's fucking brilliant. Munch is one of the few painters that I actually liked. Just the mood to his paintings, which are not surpassed. You don't find many books of explication on artists like Munch, but there you go. Here's another slip for a buck. What's it like in words? Whoa! What's it like when the phone almost falls out of your hands? This is a brand new book not to be released until December. I probably should list this one soon. It's an advanced reader's edition, or ARC as they call them, advanced reader's copy. And it's, as you can see, it's in great shape. So I will attempt to flip this and make some money. I've seen that some copies went in the 15 to $20 range, and I will gladly accept that as payment that would pay for this whole stack of books. Complete Guide to Oracle and Prophecy Methods. How You May Develop the Power to See into the Future by Joseph J. Weed. Now revealed the prophetic techniques used by the Delphic Oracle, seers in the Holy Land, the Gnostics, the Magi, Tibetan Lamas, the Druids, Nostradamus, Mother Shipton, Edgar, Edgar Casey, Jean Dixon, Arthur Ford, Maurice Woodruff, and many others. I like the chintzy looking, um, how's that called? Magic ball. Your golden opportunity, oracular influence on Greek culture. And we'll probably read this book on the channel at some point. Seems interesting enough. Let's set him off to the side. To Keep and Bear Arms, The Origins of an Anglo-American Right by Joyce Lee Malcolm. Lots of people comment on the right to bear arms as, what's this? <laughs> this, this is not a good look. Let me look at it off camera. I don't know what that's about, but I'm not going to put that name on there. A lot of people think that um, the the Founding Fathers put this... I don't know, I'm not gonna put his name on there again. That the Founding Fathers um, just kind of made the Second Amendment for home protection. And this is unfortunate. Fucking half page. But, I mean, the real reason was because they knew that governments 
tend to sour and turn on their people and become democracies wherein your rights are lost by the so-called will of the people. So the Second Amendment was not for self-protection in the general sense of protecting your home, although it was a dual philosophy, but the main purpose is to throw off a government that no longer serves the people, which ours doesn't, but I mean, yeah, there's time for redress and somebody should be redressing the government, but, and as the founders threw off the yoke of English rule, so should somebody in this country, but yeah, I mean, our government is worthless. And then again, so is half of our population worthless. But what's it matter? V for Vendetta. Obviously, a what they call that graphic novel. This has some value as well, and I might sell it if I can make. 15 bucks off it, I will definitely sell it. Good evening, London. It's nine o'clock and this is the voice of fate. It is the 5th of the 11th, 1997. The people of London are advised that the Brixton and Three of them areas are quarantine zones as of today. It is suggested that these areas be avoided for reasons of health and safety. Police raided 17 homes in the Birmingham area early this morning, uncovering what is believed to be a major terrorist ring. 20 people, eight of them women, are currently in detention awaiting trial. All right. Sounds exciting. Mindless murders, because there's a lot of them that are, hey, cerebral murders. Hey, I killed someone. I was in a, it was a real skullduggery. 20 chilling true stories. A grim record of 20 apparently motiveless murders told with all the horrifying attention to detail of a leading crime historian. I mean, do you really need a motive to, I mean, does motive really lend a certain weight to it? All flesh and blood, a hard bitten lot. The farmers of Lower Austria reflected the Judy sergeant of the missing person section, their only son, and, the, and they were reporting him missing with all the visible emotion of reporting a strayed pig. Of course, the emotion was there. A farmer with one son would be as devoted to the boy as to the Virgin Mary, and that was saying a lot in a place as Catholic as St. Paulton. This is the third book, and I assume this is a English as in England book where they do not put a period on abbreviated words like St. Paulton. I guess is it Mulberry edition. This sounds very English, bro. Yeah, see? Printed and bound in Great Britain. I don't know what's up with that, but I'm not a particular particular fan of it, to tell you the truth. I am a particular fan of this beer, which is basically knocking my dick off. Whoa. That's a beer. The House by the Divina, a Russian-Scottish childhood. Eugenie Fraser. Gaze through the open windows of memory in this remarkable chronicle of life, chronicle of life in Russia before, during, and after the revolution of 1917. The House by the Divina is the fascinating story of two families 
divided by a wide gulf of culture and geography, yet united by the Russian-Scottish marriage of the author's father and mother. Yeah, something tells me there's no drama in it that will rivet me, but I got it anyway. I like the cover. Winner's Tales, Stories and Observations for the Unusual by Jonathan Winners. Yes, that Jonathan Winters, the comedian. I've seen mostly bad reviews for this book, which is probably why I purchased it. Let's see if there's any very short stories that I could read. Eh, there's one. Maybe I'll wait. My obby, 208 to 210. Supposed to be dark humor with bad punchlines. Or attempts at bad humor. My obby. I collect rainbows after a thunder shower. They're rare. I collect authentic winks from beautiful women. I collect warm handshakes from complete strangers. I'm always, every day and every night, on the lookout for a smile. I collect the sounds of laughter, not really as plentiful as they used to be. I collect mean expressions. I have so many now. I'm ready to trade for other things. I collect thank yous and phrases like, I'll never forget you. You've made my day. I collect postcards with scenes that don't exist anymore. I have a huge collection on pain, but seldom refer to it. Like it or not, it's one heck of a part of my collection. Funny thing about pain, it's hard to trade or unload. I collect the expressions of kitties or puppies. Wish I could collect that smell that goes along with them. I collect sunsets and sunrises. You say they're always the same? Wrong. I collect the looks of patients in hospitals. Sometimes I swear no matter what has happened to them, what their color or sex is, they all seem to look and sound the same. I feel sorry for people who don't have a hobby, who don't collect anything. How many times have you heard in life? Why, hell, there are a lot of things I'd like to collect, but I can't afford it or I don't have the money. It's as simple as that. The one thing we can all collect, at least the least expensive and perhaps the most rewarding of all, are memories. Have I missed certain things that I should have collected and didn't? Sure. That's the one hobby remaining, the rarest hobby since the beginning. Not one of us can say our collection is complete without it. It's the one thing none of us can find in an antique shop. A gallery alongside the Nile off the Great Barrier Reef at the peak of Everest or at the bottom of the ocean's floor. Time. Yeah, somewhat somewhat of a nihilistic big vignette, as I've heard, but I mean, I don't know. Summer, the birds seem to sing louder and longer, and all nature comes to life. Bees and wasps, busy and buzzing, the sun beating down. As you lie on the checkered cloth and roll on the ground, and the deviled eggs are out of this world, <laughs> the sandwiches disappear and a hand goes in the cooler for a Coke or a beer. A time for the lazy, hazy ones who've waited all year for this. The young and the old that lie under the maple, the pine and kiss. The dog with an infected ear that that's covered with flies, whose tongue darts in and out as his baleful look is drawn to the skies. The putt-putt of the motorboat on its way across the pond. The splash of the swimmer and then the silhouette as he twists and turns toward the sandy bottom. The artist paints away his watercolors out as he leans forward, then sits back upon his camp chair. And high on a grassy hill sits a young girl combing her stringy but golden hair. The veterans of many wars sit and talk on the hospital grounds where the grass is worn and the visitors and patients listen to the Sousa-like sounds. Amusement parks, the roller coaster, and the merry-go-round. Teenagers in the shooting gallery, a fat woman with two ice cream cones, a drunk asleep in the tunnel of love. A screaming baby stands by a policeman. By the riverbank, a family of blacks wash their car as a white child pulls from the road. 
above a hunk of tar. What the fuck that means. If I could turn this page, I would continue with it, but I mean, maybe that's it. Nah, it just won't let me have it. Let me have it. Yeah, that was it. No? Or was that it? It was not it. The holiday outing, softball, adults and children jumping, singing and shouting. The turtle eases his hot shell into the cool, clear water. And the snake suns himself on the soggy and rotten log. As a bullfrog croaks and a coon from high in a tree smiles down at a dog. Hot, sweaty farmers make their way through rows of corn, pulling back husks and checking for worms since early morn. The white horse that's the horses that stand in the field swishing their tails, while a group of people throw blackberries in their shiny pails. In the distance, a flag is lowered, taps a boy's camp, where eyes are closed and so are dreams of the city as the tenements swelter and Park Avenue apartments suddenly become concrete blocks of pity. Alas, the sun, that ball of fire slips into darkness and quietly but quickly. The moon makes its way up to the stars and a sailboat skims across the water. The portable plays music while a couple lying stretched upon her deck gaze up at Mars. Oh, Summer, you are one warm blanket we shall never put away. I mean, this ain't my particular sort of reading, but it isn't bad. I was seeing where people were harpooning him for... I love him as a comedian, but as a writer... He's a pretty good writer, but, I mean, it's nothing great. It's just standard fear... Oh, yeah. Standard Fair Rubbish Beyond Time by Gwen Frostick. Let me get some more of this beer so I can uh, warble through this, the rest of this video. I gotta tell you, that stuff's like motor oil. But what a flavor. What a flavor, bruv. If you've been here and you've watched these videos, you know Gwen Frostick as a Michigan writer from Benzonia, a city in Michigan at some point. And she put out these little books with block cut art and inspirational, basically Hallmark card verse. And yeah. They're nice looking books, but in the individual, as in the universe, order is a profound necessity. Snow covers the fields, each twig and weed twinkles in the morning light. And as the last winds of winter fade into an echo, the rustle of spring begins, summer blends in the fall, and the humming finale of the insects rises from the tangled grasses. Here's the thing. The books are worth generally 10 to 15 bucks sometimes more when they're signed i did not even look to see if this one was signed since it was only 50 cents possibly is possibly isn't it doesn't matter i will collect them all brav and i will sell the ones i can with no intent to sell if that makes sense. My God, my fingers do not work. Right now, 1971 Presscraft Papers, Benzonia, Michigan. All right, I don't know how to say Foucault. I, just, I assume it's Foucault and Derrida, but I could be wrong. There was a guy who played for the Detroit Tigers way back. I have a baseball card of him somewhere. His name was Steve Foucault, but I believe this is probably Foucault. Foucault, one of the two. Or it could be Foucault and Derrida, The Other Side of Reason by Roy Boyne. It's philosophy. I've heard the name Der Derrida, Derrida, Doritos. I don't fucking know how 
how you pronounce it, bruv, and I'm not going to research it. But I always pick up his books when I see them because generally they're worth money. Mm, we'll see if this sticker comes off without an arrest warrant. Yeah, I did. Thank you, buddy. The writings of Michael, Michael Foucault and Jacques Derrida pose a serious challenge to all the established, but now seriously compromised forms of thought. In this critical but admiring work, Roy Boyne explains the very significant advances for which they have been responsible, their general importance for the human sciences and the forms of hope that they offer for an age often characterized by skepticism, cynicism, and reaction. Right. Um, more scary stories to tell in the dark. This is an older library binding hardcover. And I've seen the first editions, which I assume are from the 50s or 60s, go for several hundred, but... I don't think this one will, since it has an ISBN, and though it is a first edition, it's a later reproduction first, so, I mean, if some fool will pay me 200 bucks for the book, I'll gladly take it, but I don't foresee that. I actually think I have this book. Just don't know if I have it in hardcover. What's this? Uh, she was spitting and yowling just like a cat. The tales in this chapter about an empty trunk of neighbor who turns into a cat, a strange drum, some buried tasty sausages, and other scary things. Right. So, yeah, I mean, it's all dependent upon. What I have and what I need and what I will do with that book, Rob. Maritime, Grand Haven, Coast Guard, City, USA. I probably have about, I would guess, 50 plus books from this Images of America series, which are Michigan-based and for reasons that are obvious of research. They provide a good um, basic um, schematic of any little city. And they give you some cool pictures, but that's just the beginning of research, bruv. If you're really going to research, you got to find postcards and all that stuff, which a lot of the... The photographs in these books are basically um, postcards and stuff like that. Real real photo postcards, etc. But Grand Haven, I haven't been there. And I would say a couple decades with an old girlfriend. She wasn't old, but she's old now. Oh, relatively old, bruv. She ain't no young chicken. That's for damn sure. I remember, I believe in that area was the Frank Lloyd Wright inspired Snowflake Motel, but I could be wrong. Let's see if it's mentioned in here. I don't think it is. It might be, bruv. Actually, this is the Maritime Grand Haven, so I doubt it's going to show it. Stephen King, Lizzie's story. Don't know what this book is. Don't really care. Mm, 2006. Is it the first edition, bro? It would seem not, but it could be. Looks to be in pretty good condition, so if I can sell it, I will. If I can't, I'll just collect it until I can sell it for whatever I can sell it for. Finally, the origins of the urban crisis. Race and inequality in post-war Detroit. I assume it's 
World War II, but it could be both World Wars. I believe this book is marked up. No, it's not. I mean, it is, but not as badly as the other one that I have that is rather marked. Ooh. 2005. I'm not going to read this small ass print. Once America's arsenal of democracy, Detroit has become the symbol of the American urban crisis. That is not hyperbole, bro. All right, that beer is gone. And at an appropriate time since this review is just about over. In this reappraisable, reappraisable, in this reappraisal of America's dilemma of racial and economic inequality, Thomas Sugru asks why Detroit and other industrial cities have become the sites of persistent racial, racialized poverty. All right, this twelve percent is kicking in, kicking my ass. And thus, I will close this video. Video. Goodbye, bruv. Goodbye.